Good evening. We're happy to have everybody here tonight. This is the uh, second of our lectures uh, for the sustainability seminar, and we uh, welcome all of you here this evening. Uh, we're happy that you're here. Our speaker this evening is Ben Champion, and uh, Ben got his uh, bachelor's degree here at Kansas State University, and in the process uh, won a uh, Rhodes Scholarship, and so he went off to England for his study there and finished his PhD and is back, and he's now a Director of Sustainability for Kansas State University, and we're uh, very happy to have him talk about that topic tonight. Uh, the title he has up here is Early Days in the Sustainability Transition at Kansas State, and we're very happy to address that topic, and I'm sure you'll have some questions as uh, you get to the end of your talk, and we do want to have some dialogue afterwards. So I can just put this thing on my... You can put it on your belt or in your pocket. Then I'll do that. Just a second. Do that as well. Okay. Is that going to work? Is that no? That won't work? What? Here? Yeah? Okay. Okay. That's still good? Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm uh, very excited to be here, be able to address you as the university's first director of sustainability. It's not something to be taken for granted. It certainly was not something that was in the cards even a couple years ago, but um, there's been an amazing amount of, of upwelling of interest in sustainability as a topic and um, the fact that our university, our outgoing president was willing to make a commitment I think is a, uh, to a position at this point when he could have easily waited a year or two for the next president to do so is a uh, is a testament to how timely and how important the issues are and how little time we have for the transition that we um, that we face. Um, before I get into any vague or detailed discussion of what's going on at K-State, I think it's worth just a little bit of commentary about what sustainability is. Um, it's the sort of word that you're going to hear. Uh, there are as many definitions for it as there are people. In fact, I think there are more definitions for it than there are people because I myself have come up with about a dozen different definitions of it. Um, so it, it's, a, it's an amazingly diverse and I think flexible term. Um, and so in trying to come to grips with what it would mean for a university, it's, it's a pretty complicated task. Um, and I, and I, don't, uh, I don't think it should fall to one person either. So as we move, as you all move through this class, and, and definitely the students in the class that I'm teaching, sustainability science this semester, will, will have to grapple with this, is this continual questioning of what that term means. Um, it's oftentimes referred to as, uh, as about green things, about um, infusing environmental consideration into the way that we run our businesses and our public institutions and our nonprofits and our households, et cetera. Um, that's not the most uh, all-encompassing approach to the term sustainability, uh, although it's extremely important. As Chet McLaughlin talked about last week, it certainly the word itself became more common after the Brundtland Report in the late 80s and the uh, Rio Earth Summit in the early 90s when international <coughs> delegations uh, decided that it should be a common term in, in the discussions about development and about how international um, how national groups relate to each other and, and develop campaigns for the betterment of everyone. And so sustainability, as it was coined then, has a kind of three-legged tier system. It's about environment or ecology, about economics, and about social equity and social issues generally. But that's not a very precise definition. And um, even though I don't think the word really should be precisely defined, it, certainly we can do a little bit better than that. So um, I, had, uh, I have some comments here that I, I spoke about in the dialogue on sustainability that Larry hosted earlier this summer. So I'm going to uh, 
rely on some of those thoughts to just discuss some of the other potential uh, ways to think about the pat patterns of sustainability and the, the influences there. So um, again, the basic definition is that uh, that was coined by these international delegations is that it, it's about meeting the needs of the present without creating too many difficulties for future generations. So there's a time element to it. And it's about ecological, economic, and social issues all at the same time. Okay, but ecological, economic, and social issues in their own right are all very complex. And certainly the relationships between all those issues are extremely complex. So <clears throat> what do we make of that complexity? Um, complexity is not amorphous. It's not without pattern. And I think sustainability is about, first of all, acknowledging that complexity, but then acknowledging that, that certain patterns are perhaps more likely to be perpetuated uh, into the future than others. So we have to recognize that complex systems, uh, complex systems are self-perpetuating oftentimes. Uh, say the notion of capitalism has been a relatively enduring social, economic, political system in our world for the past couple hundred years. And it's absolutely likely to continue. Um, what are the forces, though, that sustain that? Well, oftentimes it's, it's a certain relationship between economics and natural resources, an ability to find energy in the world, to harness it for mechanical needs, and to uh, displace human labor to create surplus. That surplus then of capital, of resources, is available for further seeking of resources. That's a positive feedback loop, a self-perpetuating loop. It sustains itself. But what happens if that loop is somehow endangered? If the resource is th that is being drawn upon, drawn upon is finite, we reach the limit of that resource, and then that cycle becomes endangered. So we, we see in political, economic, ecological systems self-sustaining loops, but also thresholds, limits. And with those thresholds and limits, there are tipping points, points of exploitation or relationship beyond which, if you go, the system will reorganize. Also in self-organizing systems, we see that they are not static. There are cycles involved. There is growth, maturation, death, decay, and reorganization. This natural process of growth is, is a part of complexity. And so what does sustainability mean in a complex environment like that? Well, these cycles are recognition of change. So sustainability is not necessarily about identifying things that will remain the same forever. It is about recognizing patterns which are relatively resilient, that there are relatively healthy processes of growth, maturation, death, and decay that do not, and then reorganization that don't necessarily um, put in the entire populations at risk or endanger the fundamentals of the relationships of life on this planet. So, so resilience is a key word of importance when we're talking about sustainability. And so the final dimension to think about is that there are many different scales at which this, com this complex set of relationships takes place. Um, certainly in our daily lives, the scale of the individual person, sustainability is about a healthy process of, of birth, growth, maturation into adulthood, etc., eventually death and dying. Um, the level of the household, there are uh, other cycles that are of importance, at the level of the neighborhood, the local, the city or the county, the level of the, the state or region, the nation state, the world region, the globe. All of these scales, there are overlapping patterns of relationship at each of those scales. And we have to be mindful of the fact that some of the issues that we're concerned about in sustainability um, are relevant at one scale. But then the patterns that we seek to change in addressing that, say, global issue of global warming are in many, time, many cases local. 
but those changes may create difficulties or challenges in local sustainability. So this, just this, uh, this awareness of those different scales is absolutely critical. And with that, it's time to start talking about K-State because K-State is, is, uh, exists at a certain scale, right? It's a public institution. It's, uh, it, it has important relationships to everyone that's on campus, yet at the same time it has uh, a land-grant mission that lends itself importance to the state of Kansas, but it's also part of a higher education community which is uh, which is driven by federal funding and a part of our uh, our nationhood itself. So, um, so at K State we have a we have a relatively local or regional institution that depends upon relationships at multiple scales. So, with that introduction, Chet introduced this grade card last week, and it's produced by a group called the Sustainable Endowments Institute. That organization was funded by uh, Rockefeller Brothers, a nonprofit organization that likes to fund uh, charitable efforts and, um, and other nonprofits that will produce social change and respond to environmental issues. And so they gave the funding to the Sustainable Endowments Institute to rate the top couple hundred uh, largest endowments in, or largest endowed higher education institutions in North America. K-State was kind of toward the bottom end of that list of 200 in 2008. Uh, this is the 2008 report card for K-State with our endowment of 335 million. We just barely made the cut for that year. Uh, they've expanded it this year to 300 institutions. And, uh, and so we'll be joined by a lot of smaller schools as well as all the ones that are larger. But as you can see, we didn't do too well last year. We got a D plus. And they rated us according to uh, a rubric that they had created for their purposes, and uh, uh, the funny thing about these ratings is not, there's not a one of them that's the same. They've all got completely different criteria for how they judge you. Furthermore, they have different ways by which they gather information. Some of them do independent research on their own. Others send out surveys to the universities and expect us to just respond and tell them what's going on on campus. Others do a mixture of the two. Anyway, this particular report card approach, this is the first time Usually it's a top 10 list kind of approach um, to these rating systems. Well, this was the first major one to give out report cards, kind of a uh, catchy way to grade an institution that tends to grade a lot of people on a regular basis. So, so K-State got a bad grade. And, um, but this, this particular format is based on our own self-reporting, a survey system that we have to respond to. Um, and it's... Uh, organized into administration, climate change and energy, food, recy food and recycling, green building, transportation, endowment transparency, investment priorities, and shareholder engagement. Well, I think that what you'll see in the coming year, in the coming year's report, which will come out this fall, is that we'll do a lot better on some of these areas, uh, but other areas are still really much, very much lagging behind. Administration, I would expect us to be either at a, uh, a B or an A level in that we, they've created a, a position, the Director of Sustainability position. Uh, they've given credence to some of the reports of our stewardship subcommittee uh, and more. In terms of climate change and energy, though, I would expect us to remain about the same because we had, there is no overall university commitment to climate change and addressing that issue. On food and recycling, we've given a little bit more attention to recycling and our, uh, our food, uh, our dining centers and, and the caterers at the union are taking uh, local food procurement a lot more seriously. Uh, it's still not very robust, so that should go up to maybe a C or a B. <laughs> Green building, we have a number of buildings on campus that, to be built that are definitely considering LEED certification and other green building techniques, but nothing extremely firm yet. So I'd expect a better grade there, but not, nothing amazing. 
In transportation, I'm actually kind of surprised that we got a B because we don't really have a comprehensive bike system or uh, shuttle system, and we don't really have any interest in creating that at the higher levels of the administration. So um, I'm not sure what will happen there, but the interesting bits are here in the endowment section where we get Fs in our reporting on what we do with our money, and where we tend to invest in socially responsible firms or environmentally responsible firms or not. Um, we don't know where, where we're investing because we hand over the money to investment managers who then don't tell anyone. So at any rate, that's a, that's a brief rundown of where our performance stood last year and uh, gives you a certain perspective on where we might be able to go. But that's not the way that my job description is written nor the way that the sustainability planning group really would like to define the major areas of the university that are relevant for sustainability. For that, we use this framework called SCORE. Uh, it's the acronym SCORE, which stands for Student Life, Curriculum, Operations, Research, and Engagement. Now that's, that's pretty much everything, if you think about it. Um, we could define things a little bit differently because student life is about the activities of students on campus, so a lot of the student organizations, also the, um, uh, the, the lifestyles of those that are on campus, whether they're uh, empowered to make good choices in terms of resource use uh, or what impact people have. Uh, the university has more than students on its campus, and so... Um, Staff life and faculty life is also relevant. We could probably replace that term with, with campus life and it would be more comprehensive. But in the other areas, curriculum is all about what courses are offered, what majors exist and minors and graduate programs and um, certificates and degree emphases. And um, that, of course, that's an extremely important part of what the university is. It's a, a, a training uh, arena and an educational institution. Operations stands for the physical plant itself, the buildings that we occupy, the kind of energy and resource flows that go in and out of them, the grounds maintenance, the uh, accessibility of the campus itself, all of those kinds of uh, whether we're creating bike, good bike lanes and bike accessibility to the rest of the town, whether we have carpooling services, whether we have shuttles. Um, renewable energy investments, all of that stuff is, is operations. Research is, is largely academic in nature, or, uh, all of the various research activities that our faculty engage in um, in order to produce knowledge, to contribute to the betterment of society. And then engagement, and of course in research we have very uh, professional faculty in all disciplines and sustainability has relevance to we don't exactly know what sustainability is or what how disciplines what how the dis the knowledge disciplines create is relevant to it so that's something that uh, that each discipline I think has a really important role in, in addressing and as a land-grant school we have a particular outlook on on research and, and I think we have a lot to contribute as a university and then engagement is all about how we relate to the outside world, what the relationship is between the university and the knowledge that's produced here and the, uh, and the awareness that's produced here, and, uh, and then all of the various stakeholders that depend on the university's knowledge and resources. And so our extension services, research and extension in agriculture and engineering particularly, but also we have a center for engagement. We have relationships with the city and with the county and with the state and beyond, and that's what engagement is all about. And so in the area of student life, we have a lot of student organizations already that are seeking to influence uh, the awareness of their peers and the attention span of the administration towards sustainability issues and um, and the seriousness with which faculty take the subject. Students for Environmental Action. This is kind of in, in sequence from the oldest to the youngest, and I'm sure I'm leaving out some, but there's been an amazing proliferation in the past couple of years, especially with from here downward, 
All of those have begun in the past two years. Some of them, the Greeks go green is, uh, is the first Greek, uh, like pan-Greek organization devoted to environmental issues in the country. Um, and so we have some leadership going on here at K-State in that area. But what kind of influence do these student organizations have in the broader scheme of things? So what's, what's the mission of, of a student organization? Well, certainly a lot of them want to educate their peers, but a lot of them also don't have the education that they need in order to educate their peers. And so we've got a lot of catching up to do as a collective. Certainly, I'm very committed to helping these organizations to get the resources they need in order to be effective advocates because uh, um, education is not a one-way street. I mean, I certainly don't have all the answers, but I'd like to rely on them to be able to put a lot of energy into using information that I can gather for them to then come up with some outputs that make others at the university more aware, which then supports my aims as the director of sustainability and being able to get more people together and, uh, and affect all the other areas. So students, especially at this school, um, are, are powerful. They're a powerful force. The administration listens to them. And it's not only important that we educate and empower our students to leave the university with a, a worldview that fits the times, but also, they are, are an influence in shaping the university itself while they're here and, and then for generations of students to come. In curriculum, we have a great seed opportunity in the Natural Resources and Environmental Science Secondary Major Program. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary <coughs> program that features courses in, uh, in all kinds of departments and it allows a lot of flexibility for students. It's not a very popular program yet, largely because I don't think many people know about it. And it also, uh, I think, lacks a certain degree of coordination that limits its growth. And so there is, I think, great potential to, to talk with the provost about what the future of this program might be. We have models on campus for successful curriculum development and the creation of new departments and centers and institutes. The Leadership Studies program in particular has been really powerful in the past decade, come, developing largely from scratch into the largest minor program on, on campus with, I believe, over 1,500 minors um, enrolled in it. And now the building of a multi-million dollar building all their own. Um, and and the harnessing of, and the, the bringing in of really, really um, effective faculty and interdisciplinary thinkers from around the country. Uh, we need something like that here at Case State. We need a, a minor program, a major program, interdisciplinary uh, certificate programs of some kind. There are lots of opportunities for developing curriculum, and, and we're really just beginning that at Case State. But other ways that we build up to that and, and ways that we don't, uh, well, at any way, we can create new courses in departments. That's one way of addressing curriculum, just individual courses like this course, like the one in geography I'm teaching, that offer students on a one-by-one -one basis to, to learn more about sustainability. But we can also revise the student learning outcomes for courses that already exist to include more information about environmental issues, about social issues, about sustainability is interweaving all of those issues. We can create new interdisciplinary programs. Like I was saying, the NRES program could become an actual institute or department or of its own that could host an interdisciplinary program major, perhaps. Um, new majors and minors within existing colleges or within the NRES program, new graduate programs, new certificates. Any one of these bullet points would require a major undertaking by a large number of people on campus. But uh, recent reports are showing that while thousands of campuses ar around the country are taking sustainability very seriously in their operations, they are very often leaving the instructional side uh, dormant. 
many of them have some kind of environmental program, much like we have the NRES program, but, um, but very few are actually developing a concerted curriculum effort, which is really uh, disturbing because what we really need from higher education is to train an entirely new generation to think differently about the world, to, to probe those com complex relationships, and then also be prepared to participate in an emerging economy, the green collar jobs that everyone's talking about with the development of alternative energy as a major uh, energy source for society, the green building professions, um, and, and those that would, uh, all the other kind of ancillary professions that are affected by, by resource constraints and that will uh, say like the interior design departments, which design our interior building spaces are needing to consider the various uh, uh, the sources of materials that are used to furnish all of our buildings and uh, that's not something where they're going to be actively generating those materials but they need to know about what is available and what the differences are in impact between one resource or one item and another and then to engage in all the other aesthetic and uh, um, more practical issues that consume them on a normal basis. We've got to be able to promote sustainability issues in every discipline. And uh, I think that starts in a big way when we start looking at curriculum. So again, operations is an area that most universities think of first. It's oftentimes the the best idea for an administrator who's usually looking at their budget allotments and saying, where am I going to come up with the money to do more with less? Well, conserving energy reduces your utilities costs. Um, creating a livable campus, one that people really enjoy occupying or that is really interesting because of, uh, because of making it bike friendly or making it uh, greener in a literal sense or, um, or using some really cool, interesting technologies and the construction of a building brings more students in, brings more revenue in. That's what universities are all about, is, is developing their um, constituencies, largely being students, also in uh, enlivening alumni and getting them interested in donating to the university. These are all things that changes in operations can affect pretty, uh, pretty healthily. And so, uh, this is just a brief breakdown, which you probably already have seen breakdowns like this before, and especially in that report card, it has their own breakdown. But the, this is, a, this is a, an organization of, of themes that results from a, a survey that the stewardship subcommittee at the university here conducted in the spring, um, where we, we asked feedback from all the faculty at the university about uh, what was being done at the university and then what should be done. And, and so these were really the major, major themes that were brought up time and time again by people. And um, so energy certainly, but, but many different categories of, of energy engagement. So making sure that we run our buildings and our processes at the university with greater efficiency, that is having automated lights that shut off when they're not being used or having people that actually manually shut them off or um, ensuring that computers are not run all night when they're not being used and uh, replacing light bulbs with more efficient styles of light bulbs. All of those things are energy efficiency measures. Also insulation in buildings, uh, renovations in, in boilers and, uh, and, and production plants at the university that, that make them more efficient. Those are all opportunities for energy efficiency that reduce our carbon footprint but also reduce our bills but they also cost a lot of money to install in the first place. In the long run, they pay for themselves, but in the short run, we have to come up with money to install them in the first place, and therein lies the rub. Similar issues exist with renewable energy generation. Certainly at K-State, we are endowed with a lot of great wind resources. We're in a, a really massively windy region of the country, and we could capitalize on that by building wind turbines Unfortunately, oftentimes the, uh, the necessary investment capital is, is just not there to do that. Um, luckily for us, we do have a, a very uh, prolific scholar in the 
and electrical engineering department that's interested in wind energy resources. And tomorrow she'll be, she'll be installing K-State's first wind turbine next to the fire station. Uh, it's a small unit. It'll be like 60 feet tall and it's a two or three kilowatt turbine, so really just about enough to power one house. But it's, it's, a, it's a start and it'll be an interesting demonstration project that she'll be able to use to train students in electrical engineering. <coughs> But we're interested, very interested, in looking into other options. Um, Westar, our utility, is interested in donating a 750 kilowatt large-scale turbine to us. That's it's 10 years old. It's not the largest of the large, but it's still the kind. It's at the order of scale that you see when you see the really large ones on the freeway and on I-70 and such. The tower would be 150 feet tall, and then the blades would be another 60, 60 feet or so. Um, and uh, they want to donate one of their turbines at Jeffries Energy Center to K-State, but we need to find a place for it. And the turbine that large is pretty conspicuous, and a lot of people don't want it right next to their houses. And even though we'd love to put it, like, right on campus, that probably would cause some issues. We've, we've just got a lot of planning issues to work out with that one, but um, I'm optimistic that we'll find some compromise and put it somewhere near campus. Um, Beyond that, the university has potential opportunities to partner with existing wind developers and to say in a 100 turbine wind farm we might be able to contract, contract with that, a developer for something like that and, and then own one or two of those turbines which might offset the, the amount of energy that we, electricity we consume at the university. Those are some of the areas we're looking at but um, I'm not sure that you're going to find solar panels plastered everywhere on campus anytime soon. Um, but at any rate, there are opportunities, but you have to weigh all the costs and benefits and, uh, and siting issues and all that. Uh, right. In terms of transportation, the options are pretty obvious. Everyone knows what, what, uh, what kinds of options are available in alternative transportation because there are all kinds of modes of public transportation and individual transportation that don't involve personal vehicles that get 10 miles per gallon. Um, so promoting bikes, scooters, buses, there should be a comma there. Um, scooter buses might be an interesting concept for the future, <laughs> but maybe not yet. Um, yeah, promoting active commuting of all sorts. Uh, carpooling could be a really effective approach for quickly minimizing or reducing the, the kind of uh, impacts we have from, from commuting to campus. If we had a university-run carpooling system um, attached to a website, perhaps our own sustainability website that I'm currently developing, um, we might be able to really substantially reduce the amount of commuter miles involved in and that's not something that happens on campus. It's a kind of secondary effect, but it's certainly very important in terms of sustainability. It's making sure that people can get to campus and from campus from a regional perspective, um, but in a way that doesn't, that is, uh, that's resilient to things like uh, the increase of gas costs. Well, the university is a major purchaser of all kinds of stuff. Paper is probably the thing that comes to mind most readily, but also all of the carpets and all of the computer equipment and the furniture and, and all of that. We purchase a vast amount of products. And the, uh, with the rise in interest of, in sustainability in all kinds of public institutions, our state contracts for purchasing are now are being revised, um, I think at a pretty rapid clip, actually. And we, will, we have opportunities now to buy products that we previously didn't have access to. Um, and we will continue, I think, to enhance our capabilities to buy green products. But that then puts a lot of responsibility on us to learn what all of these products are about. Some of them are going to be greener than others. There's always the incentive for someone who produces a product and wants to sell it to lie to you about what how it was produced and, and greenwashing is the term for the marketing drive behind making things look green whether or not they are. Um, so we have to be prepared for that and 
that's a matter of great education within the university. We have purchasing staff here that need to begin to understand what issues are involved in the production of products and how that impacts environmental, economic, and social issues. But that whole economic side of things always rears its ugly head because purchasing green products will cost more. And when we face major budget deficits, um, and part of the, we're not going to end up just firing people all over the place to, to, ha to cut our budgets. The, way, the areas in which we cut our budgets are in our operating budgets. We stop investing in new computers and new furniture. We just let things sit. We also make sure that we buy the cheapest possible paper products, the cheapest possible pens, etc. And so as our economy continues to flounder, the tax revenues to the state continue to be reduced. We continue to have uh, less flexibility in our budgets as an institution, and therefore we have less flexibility to do more important things like purchasing green products. But this is an interesting thing to highlight, the interconnectedness of it all. Because where do the profits that fuel the tax base of the state come from? They often come from the most robust exploitation of natural resources. So while we really would love to see more tax, we would love to see the economy booming and healthy amounts of taxes flowing to the state so that we have enough money to do green things here at the university. Um, we have to acknowledge that our ability to do that is based upon an economic system at a different scale that has some pretty fundamental problems with it. So that's an aside, I guess, but it's the sort of kind of circular, scalar thinking I like it's to. Part of the complexity. It is part of the complexity. It's important to do that from time to time. Um, so waste, of course, recycling is important. Perhaps reduction and reuse is maybe more important. Um, but we have a recycling program that deserves a lot more attention than it's gotten in the past, and we, I think, we're, we're building momentum toward comprehensively addressing that. But um, but with recycling, we've got some pretty difficult issues in that there's no facility on campus for recycling. We don't have the adequate trucks. We don't have the funding to buy all the bins necessary to put them everywhere. And even if we did have bins everywhere there was a trash can, there wouldn't be the staff to go pick up the recycling from those bins. So they would be overflowing all the time. So again, it all comes down to money. Um, but building design, of course, uh, new buildings on campus can be built to higher standards, which will, over time, uh, lead us to potentially beneficial budget situations where we're not so strapped for cash. Well, that the buildings that we're building are not going to put burdens on us in the future. And that's part of this time issue we're talking about with sustainability. Building a building green is not just about feeling good about it, but it's about realizing that in 20 years, we won't be having to fuel a, a, a behemoth that's threatening to sink the university into a mire of, uh, of budget shortfall. And planning is the thing that unites all of this. One thing we really don't do at the university very well is effectively plan for the future in that way. So right now, my concern is with this more than any of these other things. I mean, I'll try and do, be opportunistic in pursuing opportunities, especially like the, the West Star thing where they want to just donate a turbine to us. That's great. Um, it'll take a lot of my time and a lot of other people's time to get it here and put up. And we'll have to find a million dollars to move it from West Star over and install it here. It would be great if we could do that. But at the same time, that's, that's just one at a timing it. And the thing about sustainability is it requires a broader scale of thought and action, and that's where planning takes place. So, so I've got about 10 minutes left, it looks like, and I better hurry up. Um, suffice it to say that research is extremely important, and there are great, great opportunities for the, the talent at K-State to provide a leading role in generating the knowledge that our society will need. <coughs> We have a lot of different silos of research throughout all various academic departments. We also have some centers and institutes that 
that go beyond individual departments that are relatively interdisciplinary, that touch multiple bases. Um, in addition, grant money for research is one of the three major sources of funding for the university. So um, to the extent to which the university is going to be successful in the future, it's going to ride with the times and do the things that are relevant to the rest of society. And in pursuing research that is sustainability oriented, it'll be answering a call, a need within society to produce knowledge that's relevant for the sustainability transition society wide. And so by positioning ourselves to do better with sustainability research, I think that we'll be creating not only a core competency for training people that come to K-State, but we'll also be more successful as a university in, in getting the kinds of funding necessary. Um, but there's a big tension between academic freedom and encouraging sustainability. I mean, uh, this is something the Board of Regents is very concerned with. They're creating a policy for all of their Regents universities in terms of sustainability. And the one thing they don't want to do is tell researchers what to think and what to study. And so, in a way, this task of promoting research and sustainability has to be something that is about culture change as a whole at the university. That individual researchers must feel compelled to do that research without having it dictated to them that that's what they have to do. So that's about creating success stories, showing that, it is, that, that a, a researcher can be rewarded and can be successful in their field by taking sustainability seriously. And certain and ways that we can do that is by creating seed grants and faculty awards and, and our targeted excellence program. Um, so as a university, I think we need to devote some some minor resources that help to to cradle researchers and and push and encourage them in the right direction with positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement of forcing them to do certain things. And then an engagement, boy, this is really a great opportunity. And I think it's, while K-State is not at the forefront of the sustainability movement in higher education, it could be in the area of engagement. Because we're a land-grant school, and I think among land-grant schools, there are very few that have taken sustainability seriously yet. And I don't think that there is a really great acknowledgement of the opportunity that extension services and other kinds of land-grant efforts can have through well, well beyond the boundaries of the university and encouraging sustainability statewide and nationally. So we have a variety of extension services uh, in agricultural extension. There are 4-H programs and there are all kinds of uh, resource programs and um, excellent work going on in extension. And much of it is already oriented in one way or another related to issues of sustainability. But I, there isn't that conscious acknowledgment that it is all about this, uh, this, this collective future and this, this three-legged stool of sustainability. So um, again, I think a, a lot of this is about uh, incorporating the word sustainability more effectively into, into the way that these programs are organized. Um, through some success stories uh, and in a way that, f that follows the needs of Kansans, um, doesn't dictate to them, allows them to tell us what they need, but then helps them to think about it differently. And so culture change is difficult, it's strange, it's nonlinear, it's complex. But I think uh, it's all about visibility in the first instance. And a website is a great way to encourage visibility of what is already happening at K-State. Uh, and then also a way of highlighting success stories that everyone can see. And being a resource that people from outside the university can tap into, that's one of the great things about the internet, is it affords us tons of opportunities for communication that we didn't have decades ago when the land grant institution was created. Also, a conference. We're creating, a, we're planning a conference for January 23rd, 2009 at the university. It'll be the first statewide conference on sustainability. And we will, in the morning, highlight activities at K-State across the SCORE spectrum. And then in the afternoon, we're going to host uh, stakeholders from around the state 
um, in government, in nonprofits, and the com in commerce, and in educational communities, to uh, to come to K State and communicate their needs and try to articulate how a land grant school could serve those needs, and that creates a dialogue. And if enough people attend this thing, it it, it can start this process of of campus-wide awareness of the importance of sustainability and the potential for framing much of what we do as a university in terms of sustainability. So I'm pretty excited about this website that we're developing and optimistic about what we'll be able to do with it. The conference will be called Leading Kansas in Sustainability because I think that's really what what the theme of this university should be. Um, and leadership is a complicated subject. I wish we had a leadership studies professor in here to talk a little bit more fluently about it. But um, again, that's partly why I'm really interested in the leadership studies department and the potential for partnership between it and an environmental studies uh, or sustainability studies program is that um, is that our ability to as a university structure begin to acknowledge in a public way all of these complex relationships and to, and to think through it at an institutional scale will provide an example to the state that I feel would be a great leadership role in the state and uh, and we can do more to lead our society by developing uh, a perspective of the land-grant school as sustainable leader uh, in training our students to effectively participate in what could become a new economy, um, to be aware citizens about the interrelatedness of things and the interdependencies and these scales and these time lags and these cycles of growth and decay. And in producing the kind of expert knowledge that we'll all need to move forward. Um, we've got a long way to go, but we've got a great resource in, in this public institution. So, um, But I think we all need to work together. It's going to take a lot more than just a half-time director of sustainability to get us moving. So um, that is about all I have for you. We Maybe we can... Spend a, yeah, be happy to Any answer questions. questions yeah. Comments? Uh, anybody want to uh, bring something up? How many of you are in the uh, NRES program? Wow. Okay. How many so. of you want to make a better grade than the K-State sustainability grade? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope you all do. Uh, okay, uh, questions? <coughs> yes. Well, I'm interested in how you think they've got to be on transportation. You know, we're not real strong in that area. Yeah. Well, look. The, what were the criteria they were looking at? Um, I don't know. They haven't released their their point system. Um, but I filled out the surveys this summer for this coming one. I didn't do it last year. Um, but. I just assumed that they had certain points allocated to certain kinds of things, and they were able to say that, well, our motor pool uses E85, and we have a little shuttle system for the, the time being because of the, uh, the construction on the, the parking garage, and, and that probably afforded us enough points, and other universities don't have shuttle systems, aren't comprehensively addressing their motor pools, and so they rated that highly. Whether that's justified or not, I don't know. Um, I think it's it's relative, it's relative to what other universities are doing. Um, so maybe in transportation, very few universities are doing very much, and the few things that we're doing is a lot relative to other universities. Uh, that's my best guess, but uh, honestly, I just don't know. That's the problem with these these rating schemes is they're 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 not very transparent about who's creating the the point systems that that we all get judged by, and then also about where the information comes from to fill out those point systems, uh, we really could use a national standard, something that's transparent and 
Dr. Yonke? Okay. I'm going to make a, a comment on that. Perhaps they were looking at the number of students that live on campus, because some campuses are more community campuses, whereas K-State has a higher percentage of people living on campus. So, well, you know, it would be interesting that, you know, what you said about the scores, and it all depends on who's advising this, the system. We should maybe come up with a self-rating system. How do we rate ourselves? Well, look, the, um, the association, the American Association for Sustainability in Higher Education, AISHI, uh, is creating a framework for evaluating. It's called STARS. It's like uh, sustainability, uh, gosh, sustainability something assessments and something else. I don't know. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's supposed to be a universal framework that all universities can use. I think that's got more value than us creating our own. We want to be we want to be referenced to other universities, certainly. But um, it's, so it's, in the transportation, they mentioned the E85 of the university fleet. We purchased a hybrid vehicle to our fleet, so one hybrid vehicle, I guess. Actually, um, we have two. two. Two shuttle buses powered by biodiesel. Uh, remaining buses use E85, and the campus has been designed to be pedestrian and bike friendly. That's what they that's what they have listed there. So. That's what they do. The they uh, actual wording is the Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System, STARS, yeah. is yeah. what the uh, Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in yeah. Higher Education. And this is a uh, trial program at this point with right. about 90 universities right. that are involved in this trial. And uh, next year, uh, it's going to be uh, started with the idea that everybody is going to be encouraged to participate. Other questions? Yes? I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but do you know who was the best school, who got the best grade, oh, that's or a didn't good they question. do top 10 or something? I'm sure uh, well, I know some of the high flyers that are likely to be at the top. I don't know specifically, but I, I think Harvard is darn near the top. Uh, they got the most money to throw at this. They have not just one director of sustainability. They have an entire green team that's composed of like 35 full-time people. And so it's, they're doing a lot. Um, CU Boulder, I know, it ranks pretty highly. Arizona State University. Um, some smaller colleges on the East Coast, uh, like University of Vermont, maybe somewhere. Uh, I think some liberal arts colleges that are pretty well endowed relative to the size of their campus have been able to do a lot. Uh, maybe her. Yeah. Do you know how KU compares in the leadership area of sustainability for Kansas? Well, leadership isn't rated. Um, I mean, so you I'm talked a, about the leadership in research and how uh -huh. the conference is going to be held at K-State. And uh -huh. I was wondering how KU compared. Um, KU is, is doing a lot. They have a lot better recycling program than we do. Um, they have an office of sustainability <laughs> with not a half-time person like myself, but a full-time person, a couple graduate student assistants. But we're roughly equivalent on that front, although they've been at it. Now, they've had their sustainability expert now for a uh, about two years and I just started, so a little bit of lag there. Um, they are working on some pretty interesting projects like uh, creating biodiesel from used vegetable oil on campus and some composting efforts. Um, I, I don't know if they're doing much beyond that, but I know that they're, I think they're doing some active uh, uh, carbon emissions assessments and so that's about auditing the university to get a sense of how far they have to go. Um, they're doing fairly well with their own operations. I mean, they're doing, I think, with better than us, generally speaking. But in terms of the, their researchers um, and some of the area, other areas of the university, I know that their student groups tend to, they have more student groups active. I think their student population is just generally more interested in these issues than ours. But, uh, but ours is coming up quick, um, especially with the Greek system. We have, a, I think, a stronger Greek system here. And uh, if they continue to commit their interests to these issues, then students um, will be maybe kind of on par. But the other areas of the university, in terms of engagement, I think K-State, absolutely, with its extension services, the land-grant mission is, is definitely uh, has an opportunity to surpass them in that area in terms of influence statewide. Um, so it's a mixed bag, I think. The University of Kansas is involved in the STAR program on a trial basis, yeah, right. so they're one right. of the 90 schools that are involved in that. 
Yeah. You mentioned the gift of the windmill. Uh huh. What kind of possibilities exist for siting that? What are you thinking, and how would it work? Well, we were looking at the Riley County shops on 24 Highway. That would be ideal in terms of wind resources, and still pretty close <coughs> to campus for accessibility from the uh, student perspective and the research perspective. Um, our conversations with the county ground to a halt recently for some bizarre reasons I'm not going to get into. But um, well, there's that, an election coming up. Maybe well, they'll be better after that. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it was silly. Just suffice it to say it was silly. Um, but I've had contact recently with the foundation, and they're building a new building right next to the, close to the stadium there. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, there may be a possibility to put it there. <coughs> And with the siding, would we be able to actually put the energy production into? Well, we have to talk to West Star and figure that out. But yeah, I think the plan would be, see, it depends on the siding and the funding as to what the purpose is. Um, if we're really concerned about if the money comes from a research grant budget then uh, to, to install it, then we can probably survive without producing a lot of electricity from it. It'll be a, re a training resource and a research resource for us, um, but we, then we could afford to put it in places that aren't ideal in terms of the wind itself. Uh, if we're depending upon the electricity revenues to pay for it over time, um, then we have to put it in the most ideal spot possible to get the most electricity generated from it. So balancing those factors and then finding a spot where the landowner will actually let us put it there, and where we can get the zoning permissions and all that, that is a, you know, a multi angle issue there and, and we're just beginning with those discussions. Uh, the next topic next week is wind energy. Mike Steinke is a wind developer from Oklahoma and uh, so I invite you to come back for sure. that. Uh, our time is up so I think I'm going to stop at this point. Let's uh, give our thanks. <laughs>